coming up, I check out the Fuller FDS keyboard. I play some games. I read a book. And end with a typing. Let's get on then. I have quite a few replacement keyboards for the Spectrum, but one that has evaded me for a while is the Fuller FDS. Not as common as the DK Tronics offering, and hardly ever seen on seller sites. Early adverts began to appear around the end of 1982. Early pictures showed an image of the ZX81 keyboard, but declaring it was now available for the Spectrum. The Spectrum stripes have been added too. This keyboard had 42 keys, and became known as the Fuller FD42. Next, around late 1983, came a Frankenstein model. It looks terrible, and was a sort of crossover between the FD42 and the new FDS keyboard about to be released. The next iteration was mid to late 1983, showed a much improved looking model with the tag power to your fingertips, and looking very nice indeed. A slatted back for heat dissipation, and the fuller sticker top right. A smaller image displayed the internals, and how the Spectrum and Interface 1 would fit inside. I'm slightly worried about that open power supply, but never mind. This sold for $49.95, and for that you get a full-size spacebar and two function keys, separate cursor keys and keys for delete and shift. The design changed again in early 1984, using the tag Transform Your Spectrum. Was this wording meant to be misleading, I wonder? Transform also made a keyboard, and a very good one at that. Anyway, also selling for $49.95, Fuller claimed that it was the best-selling Spectrum keyboard in the UK. I don't know how they could back that up though. It had the same slatted back as the previous model, but the sticker was moved to top left. Extra keys gave access to things like delete without having to hold shift, and the cursor keys. There were also two function keys, F1 and F2. There were separate full stop and comma keys, as well as a full size spacebar. Fuller sadly went into liquidation around September 1984, owing over £100,000. Nordic bought them out and continued to sell their range of products. On to the keyboard itself then, and here is the Fuller FDS keyboard, the last of the Fuller range. I got this in a very dirty condition, and it took a long while to get it to a state where it could be reviewed. Fitting a Spectrum inside involves taking the motherboard out of the original rubber keyed case, and fixing it to the bottom of the keyboard using two small screws. Two keyboard cables from the top part of the case plug in where the previous ones did, but the power is a bit messy. Because the keyboard itself needs power, you have to plug the Spectrum power supply into that, feeding the cable through, and then a cable from the keyboard loops back outside the case and plugs into the Spectrum's motherboard. I did a fix to this by removing the lead on the keyboard and soldering it to the Spectrum's power connector. Plugging that into the top part of the keyboard meant everything was inside the case. The case is held together with four screws, and it's ready to use. Alongside some other keyboards, it's slightly smaller than the DK Tronics model, and higher than the Saga, or low profile. The plastic is a bit thin, similar to the DK Tronics version, but the keys are really nice. In use, you get a nice satisfying click, although these are not modern switches but they still sound good and have a decent enough travel. The single keys for the cursors work fine, as does the delete key, but it does take some time getting used to having them. The two function keys were a mystery until I read a review from Sinclair user. The F1 key puts the Spectrum into extended mode with access to the red functions on the keys. The F2 does the same, but for the green functions. That could be quite useful once you get the hang of it. For games, you get a nice tactile feedback, and along with those clicks, gives a nice feeling. The click can, if you don't amplify your spectrum sound, be louder than the poor little speaker inside. Obviously, where this keyboard comes to life is typing. Either typing out games listings, playing adventure games, or even word processing. This is far better than the rubber keys.
a really nice keyboard then. Not in my top three, or maybe joint third. I don't know, maybe I should do a top ten of favourite keyboards, although I think I've only got six or seven. Anyway, it took a long time for me to finally get hold of this, and the lengthy clean-up process was well worth it. The original motherboard that was inside worked fine. I did swap it out for a recapped and composite modded one, which I have on standby. The old board needs recapping and composite modding though, just in case I get another keyboard or one of my other spectrums fail. The fuller FDS keyboard then is a very good choice, and I don't think anyone who got one at the time would have been disappointed. Triple Trouble was released by Software Projects in 1984. If you are not aware, the name comes from a Star Trek episode entitled The Trouble with Tribbles. Tribbles are small furry creatures with an enormous appetite to reproduce, taking over anywhere they find themselves. Sadly, this game doesn't include any such mechanic. The game inlay states, wait for this, Brian Skywalker is a Tribble farmer. Hang on, that's a different franchise, isn't it? Anyway. The game has five different sections and is based on the premise that the Tribbles will always follow Brian around and move in the direction he's facing. Using this mechanic, on the first level, Brian has to build a bridge across a river. Annoyingly, the Tribbles keep escaping from the spaceship, so Brian has to keep herding them back in. If that wasn't enough, firebugs keep appearing from the volcanoes, and these can kill the Tribbles. To build a bridge, Brian has to dig and find magic gems when he sees them sparkle, which he can then push around the screen and get them into the river. If you manage to build the bridge, it's onto level 2, the Gopher Desert. Here, Brian has to guide a Tribble to their favourite food, gophers, and avoid the cacti. At this point though, I gave up, so the rest of the footage is from the RZX playback. Complete this and it's level 3, the Spheroids. Here, Brian has to burst the spheroids with a spike to allow the Tribble to move on. This is quite an annoying level, as the movement is random, so you just have to keep dropping the spike and hoping for the best. Level 4, Snappers. Here you have to propel a Tribble across the screen to eat the mushrooms, and I think mushrooms may have been involved in the writing of this game at some stage. Anyway, the Tribble has to be pushed just at the right time to avoid the snappers, otherwise he'll bounce back. And finally, level 5. Brian has to round up the Tribbles into a pen to complete his task. All of this with a time limit in the form of air, just like Manic Miner. The graphics are typical early software projects. Large and well animated, but sometimes flickery. Gameplay drifts from monotonous to annoying, really, with some good ideas in between. Gameplay is tricky, keeping those Tribbles out of trouble is a challenge, and getting used to controlling them is the key, and even then they've got a tendency to, to wander off and get killed. Sound is used well with some good effects, but for me it was just too tricky, with limited time and at times uncontrollable Tribbles, and it felt more often like hard work than a game you should be enjoying. Legend of the Amazon Women was released by US Gold in 1986. A plane crashes in the jungle. The only survivors are a woman and her daughter. Upon waking up, the woman finds her daughter missing and so sets off to find her. The game starts with a very long scroll across the landscape, and there's no reason for this, and you just want to get on and start playing the game. Eventually, when the game does start, the first thing I noticed was the game reminds me of two other games, Tierna Nog for the animation, and Fighting Warrior for the crap gameplay and general look. You start with a club and have to beat up Amazon women. You can jump and duck, but poking the right and thrust key combinations will usually get rid of them.
You can also hit them on the head or hit them on the knees. As they died, they drop their weapons. And if it's an improvement on the club that you start off with, you can pick it up. Well, that's the idea, but I never managed to do it. Other weapons are limited to just a sword and an axe. There's a radar at the top of the screen, a bit like Defender, and you can see things heading your way. This is useful later on when things like arrows and spikes are thrown at you from unknown sources off screen. The arrows and spikes are a real pain, but do break up the boredom a little bit. Later levels, if you can bear playing that long, have dragons that appear from the ground. As you can see, the graphics are good, but it's all been done before. The combat as well is, well, nothing new or exciting, and you can get pretty far in the game by using the technique mentioned. If you want to try hitting higher or lower, just for a bit of variety, yes it's different, but it has the same effect. The landscape never changes apart from the odd tree or plant, and the enemy never changes as well. The jungle must be host to a gazillionettes, if there is such a thing. Sound is poor with just a standard beep for when you hit something. Terrible, really, for a 1986 game. And of course, we can't forget that cover. The artist himself said it was terrible, and often referred to it as the leg end of the Amazon women. Despite the graphics, a below average game all round then. Of the many famous names in the dart scenes of yesteryear, probably the one you think of first would be Eric Bristow. Nicknamed the Crafty Cockney, he was the number one between 1980 and 1987, winning the World Championships five times and the World Masters five times, among many others. He reveled in upsetting his rivals with cheeky comments and off-putting interviews. He said what he felt, which sometimes annoyed people and often got him into trouble. A true great of the game then, he sadly passed away in 2018. In 1984, Quicksilver released Eric Bristow's Pro Darts. The tape has lengthy instructions on the first side, covering how the game works, which, as we will find out, is totally weird and not like any dart game I have ever played. Once you've read those, you can load the game. You first start by picking the number of players, and you then enter your name, along with number of matches and number of sets. When the game starts, you or Eric throws first, although there's no actual throwing involved. When it's your turn, you have two options. You can move the cursor on screen, which is tediously slow. Or you can hit the A key and enter the intended target. For example, T20 would set the target as treble 20. You can still move the target afterwards, but only in character squares. You then press T to throw, and the computer works out some random numbers in the background and decides whether you're going to hit the target, drift wide, hit the wire, or get a rebound. And then it all starts again for the next dart. The graphics are average for a dart game, and the movement is awful and slow. The sound, well, is just standard beeps. Even the screen update, like the scores for example, feels very slow and just like a basic game. And sure enough, if you merge the game you can view all the glorious basic code. There are three small machine code blocks, 50 bytes, 60 bytes, and one just over 3K, plus a loading screen, but apart from that, it's basic. I spent more time looking through the listing than playing the game. There's a routine that runs if you get 180. It's not very exciting, though. Quicksilver must feel embarrassed about putting this game out. 
and Eric certainly deserves better. It's not very often I cover books or printed material, but recently I got this, the Retro Annual 2020. Yes, I know it's old, but it was cheap at the time, only $12, included postage, and I bought it for another reason which we'll get on to. I thought I would get it and judge the quality and possibly order more if I liked it as well. Well, I do like it. The whole thing is very well made. The cover is thick and solid, and the inner pages are printed to a very high standard. And the content is, well, retro. I love the cover, lots of retro stuff on there to find. And inside, we get features like the one here about the story of E.T. on the Atari VCS. It's been done many times before, so I won't dwell on it. This intrigued me, the shaking, and it says the game is for the Spectrum. The link goes nowhere, and I couldn't find anything at all, and then I discovered this page where a demo can be downloaded. Sadly, it looks like it's been abandoned. It looks like an interactive story told through different pictures. There are decision points along the way, but it seems it never got completed. When you reach a decision point, a reel will appear top right with a number on it which represents the tap file you need to insert next. If you choose to do that, the story branches, or you can keep moving past that and take another branch. The images are all digitised and you have an option of going through manually or after a certain time. The only problem with doing that is that you miss some of the text, so you have to keep pressing the right key. This can sometimes lead to jerky animation and border flashing. I have tried various routes and having to hit the right key to move on doesn't do it justice really. If you hold the key down you get nice animation rather than pausing between each frame. But you can easily miss one of the decision points if you do that. Anyway, a nice little distraction there, let's move on. There are reviews of various games released in 2020, obviously. So there's Amstrad reviews, including things like Sergeant Helmet, and Space Moves, and Scramble. There is, of course, sections for the Commodore 64, with games like Soul Force and Outrage. And then there's the Spectrum stuff. Here's Wonderful Dizzy, getting all tens. And this, the reason I bought it, the best Spectrum games of the last 20 years. Castlevania, Aliens Neoplasma, Sword of Iana, Valley of Rains, and all the usual candidates. Some of them I've not covered on the show, others I have. So this gives me more things to review. There's even an Amiga section reviews of games like Zero Sphere and Power Glove and more. They also do other magazines as well, so if you like printed material, definitely take a look. Johnny the Ghost was released very late in 2023, almost 2024, and a game that I missed when it came out for some reason. This is a great puzzle game, using a similar idea to many others, but this one does it really well. There's some great music while playing along, which makes the game quite relaxing. The idea is that you have to collect all of the helmets, at least I think that's what they are, and to do this you have to work out how to get to them. what to push, what to climb, and later on, what to hang down from. A 
and once you clear a path, you can collect all of the helmets and on to the next level. The early levels are there just to get used to things and don't really cause any problems. Push the crates to fill the gaps, making sure you don't get trapped, but if you do, you can always press the R key to restart. The graphics, as you can see, are very good, with a character of their own. They're well drawn and move smoothly. Control is excellent too, and I had no problems at all controlling Johnny. As time goes on, things start to get harder, and you spend more time staring at the screen, trying to work out what to do before actually attempting it. Sometimes if you go wrong, you can get stuck and have to restart anyway, so at least that option's there, which is a good thing. I really enjoyed this game, and it's very much recommended. This is Yes and No, written by W. Mansell, that appeared in Sinclair Programmes April 1984. It's a very short listing, and one that's not available on the internet, at least not when I type this out. It may be a short program, but it's quite fun and it's not a game. You ask the computer any question, as long as it can be answered with yes or no. The computer will then respond with one of 25 random replies. It's almost like a chatbot. I'm going to have a conversation with it while you listen to some music. Fun, isn't it? But how can we improve it then? Well, first we can add some more replies. I've added more than 25 new ones, so that should be good. I need to get rid of that keyboard beep, or at least make it shorter. So line 1200, just poking a value of 1. Then we can add a nice font. And there it is. I don't think there's much more we can do other than keep adding more replies, but it's difficult to think of them. Maybe you can come up with some. I suppose you could start adding insults, but that might not be a really good idea to broadcast that. But let's leave it as it is for now, and enjoy the weird conversations you can have. 